the entire part of my life that I just appreciate. You know, it was just such a good time in everybody's lives. From boogie boarding to surfing to photography, it all started there. It was pretty cool how everybody called each other uncle and aunt. Everybody knew each other. It was, it was its own small community that lasted the 10 weeks, 11 weeks of summer. The buildup probably started in the year 2000. Every year, every summer was our last summer. My name is Mike Gleason. I'm 37 years old and I am from West Long Ranch, New Jersey. I was brought to the beach when I was an infant. Um, that's when we all started going. All my brothers, as soon as we were born, my parents were taking us to, to TAC and uh, you know, that's how we grew up. The feeling and vibe of TAC was always very mellow. It was a family oriented beach. Kids running around everywhere, kids playing, adults hanging crowded little beach but always a good time and um, everybody knew each other it was it was its own small community my name's Tim Gleason uh, myself and my family started going to Taknasi in about 1982 or so around that area and uh, right up to the end right up to 2010 uh, we were members there uh, pretty much depending upon what time you got down there you either got in the front lot uh, the middle lot, or you ended up out on the across the street by the uh, by the church. Very rarely, when I went down, did I have to park anywhere other than right on the beach. Um, and and I don't think I've ever ever gave my car to anybody to go park for me. I, I if anything, I, I would do it if I had to. My name is Kyle Arcamano. I'm from Long Branch, New Jersey, and I'm 34 years old. So you enter Tacanassi through it was a. Uh, a rock bed driveway. Very annoying on your bicycle because you'd always slip around and fall. But then there was an office on the left and Scott Peters, the owner, his house was on the right. And everyone had to access through this point. And um, once you go through there, it wrapped around heading towards the ocean. There was a row of lockers, famous lockers, big pool on the left, and then you kept driving and then baby pool a little further. And then it opened up to this big dirt lot. That's where we would park all the cars and we would triple park cars on a weekend. And you just have to drive in, you leave the keys in your car and leave your car unlocked, and you trusted the car parkers, myself and three others, to just hang out, watch the cars, and if someone needed their car moved, you come find us in the back parking lot. We move the car for you. As a car parker at 14 years old, I was getting tipped in beer and not cash. <laughs> and people would be like, here's a six pack and here's the keys, like, take the car, enjoy. The beach was great. There was, um, it was a small beach, but it was lined with cabanas. If you were lucky enough, you had a cabana that was on the beach. There was a boardwalk that went all the way across from one cabana to the next to the next. So the whole length of the beach was an old wooden boardwalk. And uh, I, know that, I know that sound in my head of like kids running on it. You could be sitting somewhere and you, you hear just kids running along that boardwalk. And there were nails times that stub popped your, up. How yeah, many times you stub your, you stub toe, your like toe on the two by fours, or like there would be a nail that popped up. Like I was saying before, they didn't really up, uh, upgrade the place or maintain it. So you stub your toe, maybe a nail here and there. Most people had lockers there, so kept everything in the lockers, so didn't have to lug everything back and forth. Of course, a cooler with beer and wine or whatever and, and food, you know, that would that would come down on a daily basis. But other than that, everything was in the locker. Just go out there, go up, pick up your chairs and and walk them down and that, you know, 50 feet you had to walk them. It wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Probably 10 good buddies of mine and their families went there uh, at the same time we did. Their kids grew up with my kids and uh, we uh, would stay there till nine o'clock at night. Just, you know, we'd get dinner down there and we'd be there from nine o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night. Depending on what day it was, a lot of dinners down there. Um, you know, everybody would get together, bring something. There was always a grill going. Um, yeah, it was just, people were great. That's what it was. It was everybody was fantastic. The sense of community at Takanasi was like no other. Um, whether it was the summer, we'd spend all day at the beach, uh, barbecues following after, but even to this day, all our families still hang out and um, all my closest friends are from that beach. Takanasi was always a second home to me. 
and uh, it's where all my friends were. Great community built around, so the aroma was always fun and active. When I was going to Takanasi, my parents would drop me off, spend the whole day there, and depending if there were waves or not, we'd spend a lot of time in the ocean. We'd go across the street to the lake and go fish. We'd play a lot of cards. Always playing some kind of games. Ping pong was huge, a lot of ping pong. Um, depending on the tide, you'd go over to Dinks and jump off the seawall. That was always fun, playing the backwash over there. There was a cabana pool, but you had to have a cabana to go in that pool. But I wasn't, I had a locker, so I wasn't allowed in there, but they did have a diving board. And I guess if you knew the lifeguard too, you'd be like, hey, you know, let me, let me get in here for a bit. Everybody could obviously go in the baby pool and the big pool, unless it was kids' time and parents' time. And they had parents' time. They actually had an hour or two a day where they would kick all the kids out of the water, and it was for that hour, only parents could be in there. And <laughs> that, was, that was interesting. And then same thing in the cabana pool. The cabana pool had a diving board though. And um, yeah, it turned into some diving contests for sure. It was great. I will say it was one hell of a sandy pool though, because you had this, the sand was as close as you said. So everyone would just go from the ocean, roll around the sand and then jump in the pool. Uh, but it was a great experience because you knew once you were done boogie boarding or surfing, you had a pool to go to. Well, the beach club at that stage of your life was kind of everything because you're so young and everything's so new in all, on all facets of life, but you know, a lot of it based off the water. Well, Takanasi kickstarted my hobbies, whether it was boogie boarding that transitioned into surfing or photography, um, all those things started at Takanasi Beach Club. Uh, I had my first water housing for my camera, started at Takanasi Beach Club. So I would go in the water and take photos and video of whoever was launching or surfing or just jumping around in the pool. Um, and to this day, I, you know, I've upgraded to different water housings, but it all started there. They had an annual boogie board contest, which I actually have a trophy I should bring into the scene because I think it's hilarious. So yes, Takanasi Beach Club had an annual boogie board competition and all the kids look forward to it. And um, here's one of the trophies here. This is third place. Uh, the Arcamano family always took home second and third. The Gleason family has all of the first place trophies. Uh, unfortunately, I never got one of those. So even when I was younger and I was kind of a scared kid, like I wouldn't um, like to surf the big waves, but I grew up watching, you know, my dad, all my uncles, they were all bombing waves and just hooting and hollering at each other. And, the bigger the waves got, the more hyped up they got. They were all foaming at the mouth to get out there. Couldn't beat the surf. The waves every day, probably one of the best surf spots on the east, you know, at least in New Jersey. You know, everything came from there, you know. Uh, we grew up watching our parents in the water, our uncles in the water, whether it was boogie board or surfing, kickboarding, body surfing. Um, so naturally growing up, you just wanted to be in the water. And I just started going on my father's back when he had a kickboard. He'd take me out on his back and ride waves in. Then it turned into boogie boarding, looking up to my brothers. It turned into standing up on a boogie board. And then I got to the age where I was allowed to surf. You know, my first wave uh, I, that I remember, that I physically remember was um, on a pass down single fin. It was at Dinks. Um, I was six years old. And that's the first wave I remember standing on. I had um, my best friend at the time, Adam Muniak, he started surfing and got good really fast. So we had a, a back and forth for years and just trying to outdo each other. And that really progressed us both. You had a lot of really good surfers who, you know, you just grew up wanting to be better. And I always wanted to be better than them. So Takanasi Lake, it was very convenient that it was right there. Uh, days that there weren't waves, you know, we could just go across and go fishing with all the, the light tackle and banjo minnows and the power bait. I mean, that's where we all started fishing. Fishing there, when we were younger, we'd just go to the lake. Fishing with worms and bobbers and stuff like that, catching bluegills and... But growing up, we always got to watch one of the, a guy there named Carl. He fished religiously there every single day. And um, you know, a lot of fishermen, when you're surfing, they don't care. You know, they're gonna keep fishing. But Carl was always like, hey, which, which side of the jetty are you gonna be on? I'll fish the other side. 
So we always grew up watching coral catch fish, Oceanside, and then as kids, we would just go to the lake. There is, my, one of my, my first striper memory is from there though. Only, my dad only threw a chicken scratch bomber. Only Lou would throw. Like I said, I told you that he only threw chicken scratch bombers, but he also threw a Hopkins. It was either a Hopkins or a chicken scratch bomber. I forget what we were throwing. And uh, he would cast out off the jetty and let me reel it in. And I'll never forget, I watched this thing come and eat right at the rocks. And I think Carl ended up gaffing it, or Carl got down to the rocks and got it for us. But yeah, he would know the story better than me. That was great. It was, it was, that, was, uh, that was a great moment. You know, I, I remember we initially thought we're, we're shipping off, we're, we're, we're uh, fishing off a bulkhead, and we're 20 feet up. We're 20 feet off the water, easy. And we're reeling it in real slow. It's, it, it's a Hopkins, and we, we think we got snagged on something, and Michael had the pole in his hand, and then all of a sudden, the line took off, and we knew we had a fish. And uh, it was impressive. That, that was a, and the thing was that we were probably 15 feet from shore. Yeah, we were right, right, right in the shoreline. Uh, when, oh, yeah, yeah, when we, when we hooked it, yeah. I had um, a, guys, a couple guys that I surf with. Still to this day, I told him, I was like, uh, hey, I, I, I want to be become a surf caster. And my buddy Corey was like, hey, you need waders, you need a surf rod. And at the time, I had just become pro as a surfer, and I had a couple bucks. And sure as shit, the next day, I showed up at the beach with waders and a surf rod. And he's like, well, I, you know, he, he didn't think it was going to happen. He's like, all right, let's, let's go. I love the grind of fishing. Fishing is a puzzle. You got to put the pieces together. You got to figure it out. You do pattern things and over the years you put together what you did last year and timing wise. But inside those seasons, you do have to grind it out and find the fish and find what they're biting on, where they are. And that's what I love about it. I love, I love working hard to get on bites and, and figuring stuff out and then beating on fish. <laughs> Never die hard till I got a little older and then I really got the bug. And then when that bug set in, it's now it's, God, it's 20 years later and it's just, it's just as strong as, a, you know, as it was when I first started. So back to the community of Takanasi, there was an annual end of the year uh, tradition where Billy Delahanty and Robert Lehman would make a wooden boat with a flare on it and no matter the swell size, sometimes they would do it during a hurricane, they'd swim out, light the flare and push the boat off and just, you know, that was the end of the year, that was the send off. You knew by the end of the year the, the owner was ready to at least get a break. You know, take, you know, walk away from it for, for a few months and then, and then come back to it. It was a family, it was in the same family for probably 80 years or so. So we were all thinking that, you know, next year it's going to be open again, even, even uh, with the rumors. But the buildup probably started in the year 2000. Every year, every summer was our last summer. So we didn't know what to expect the following year. So when it kept reopening every year, we were all pumped. But uh, once he passed away, that was it. His wife, his wife was willing to give it up and his sister wanted to, wanted to sell it. And his brother, I guess, the, the one other brother, uh, didn't really care which way it went or not, so. Uh, it sucked, you know, when the beach, when they finally sold it, it, it was a bummer. You know, they, um, it, you know, it was an end of an era, what it was. I was, I must've been 21 at the time, so I was past, I, I, I'm so fortunate that I got, I, my whole childhood was there all the way through, up through my teenage years. And, um, but yeah, it was a bummer. I mean, now that I have a son now, I would give anything for him to grow up in that scene. Are you kidding me? Like, but um, yeah, it sucked. It, it, it sucked. Everybody was bummed, you know, about the selling of it, you know, but it, again, Kyle touched on it. Like it, it was for sale for, you know, for a long time. And, and every year was a bonus, you know, and every year, we got older, like, oh, it's never gonna sell, but you know, it eventually did. Everybody was scattering for new places to go to. Um, you know, whether they went up to Monmouth Beach or, or down to Deal or, or you know, in between, um, everybody's, everybody was, you know, was searching for a new beach club. And uh, uh, we had lost our tack. When we were young, we didn't realize what we had, but as we grow older, and I look back at it now, it's like we had the coolest place on the East Coast, and now it's gone.
so Nick, Nick gave me a call. He was working at Bagel Masters. I was still surfing. I still had my professional career, but it was like coming to an end. And he had an idea. He's like, oh, I want to do this thing about states and fish. And then we just kind of put our minds together and came up with Tack Waterman with the help of Kyle. You know, we, we had an idea and we're like, hey, Kyle, can you put this to paper? And that's when the NJ Striper logo came about. And then Tack Waterman was born. That was about 2016. We had the brand and we were doing okay, you know, chipping away. It wasn't something where it was like, all right, I'm gonna leave surfing for it. I was bartending at the time too. And Nick had his job at Bagel Masters. And then he finally was like, hey, listen, I'm quitting Bagel Masters. I'm, I'm, we're gonna go full board. Do you wanna do this? And the opportunity that the space was open, he's like, listen, I think we should, it's either do a, a storefront or a showroom. There hadn't been a fishing store in town in 10 years. We were like, let's, let's try to do a shop based around our brand not just sell our brand but sell fishing and surfing items that that's what our brand is based off of our love of surfing our love of fishing so we're like let's let's see if we could put the two together now it is what it is it's it's grown tremendously i don't know if either of us thought it would be where it is today all the people i know they all have some type of tack waterman you know, to, to, keep the, to keep the tack name going. They've got some type of clothing or whatever, hats to, uh, to remember the place by. The one thing about the store that I, I really appreciate is when I have friends from out of town that come in and say, well, where'd you guys come up with the idea to, to combine surfing and fishing? And they're like, oh, it's such a great idea. You know, Nick and I both surf and fish and a lot of the people in our community, all our friends, are, they're surfers and fishermen. And to hear people compliment us and be like, hey, that was such a good idea. It was, it's just a really cool feeling that we get. But I think as far as, as far as the brand goes and the store, I think it's more keeping the name alive and keeping the memories alive. People talking about it like, oh, I went there. You know, we have a lot of people who are like, oh, I remember going there as a kid, you know, stuff like that.